It's a very sensible idea, isn't it? Especially these days when fuel prices are going up and up, why would you take two cars when one would do? And so there are places for park and share where commuters can arrange to meet and travel along together. They didn't have cars in Bible times, of course, but they did do a lot of traveling together. You could flick through the Gospel of John, for instance, and note the several times when the Lord Jesus and his disciples journeyed to Jerusalem for different feasts. That was the custom those days, as it had been for centuries while there was a temple in the city. The people travelled up to keep the feasts. They usually travelled in company, just like the Lord and his disciples. And possibly they sang together as they made their way. There are 15 psalms grouped together in the Psalter, each with a title like A Song of Ascents. These songs probably were used when going up to Jerusalem. The third of those songs tells of travelling together. It's Psalm 122. Let me read its words for you now. Uh, follow with me if you have a Bible to hand. Find Psalm 122 and let us hear the word of God. It says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel, for there stand the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. And that's the end of the psalm. It closes with that call to prayer. Well, let's take a moment ourselves to pray just now. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, Father. Thank you for this little opportunity to read it, to hear it, to meditate on it, and to be blessed through it. May we see more of the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may work in faith, labour in love, and endure the hope that you bring to us by your Holy Spirit. Let your will be done in us, O God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And Psalm 122 says, it was great to be together. Well, that's part of it at any rate, isn't it? I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We don't know when this psalm was written. I would hazard a guess that David might have composed it for people to learn, sing, and then take home with them when he gathered all Israel to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. That's only a guess, though. At some point, the psalm was added to the repertoire of songs of ascents. And it celebrates togetherness. Well, there are all sorts of reasons for people to be together. Some of us still are just getting into the way of it again after the isolation of lockdown. We all have discovered that being on our own may have been necessary for health reasons, but it wasn't exactly healthy. It's good to be able to meet up once more. There is joy in being together. But Psalm 122 has a specific focus. It starts off recollecting a time when the group gathered and journeyed and together arrived at the house of the Lord. Verse 2 really says, standing were our feet in your gates, O Jerusalem. Verses 1 and 2 together tell us about the place of true togetherness. They tell us of the place of full salvation. The place of full salvation. You see, the song points us to the city of Jerusalem and to the house of the Lord within it. After David's day, that meant the temple. And for a thousand years or so, the city and its temple were the focal point for God's people. Both city and temple always pointed, though, to something more, as indeed did the promised land within which they were found. God gave prophets like Ezekiel visions of a new land a new city, and a new temple. Isaiah saw the mountain of the Lord's house raised above every hill and the nation streaming to it. The earthly Jerusalem 
pointed to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the kingdom of grace where people will live with God forever. The temple pointed to the new creation and to the dwelling of God among men and women and his glory filling all the earth. City and temple both point to the place of full salvation, to the land of pure delight. They point to the time when people will stand before the Lord in holiness and glory, to when people will rejoice together in God's presence eternally. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Listen, every day brings us nearer to the time when all the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Some of us may have to go down into the last valley before that day arrives. But when you have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you know that you depart to be with him, which is better by far. That's what the Apostle Paul told the Philippians. He also told them, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Saviour from there. When Jesus is your Saviour, you are a citizen of the heavenly city, this Jerusalem above. God will fulfill what he has promised. He will bring in that new world at Christ's appearing. We are travelling on towards it. But we also enjoy a foretaste of it now. City and temple point to God's kingdom of grace and his dwelling with people. When you put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, God receives you as his own. He makes you a child in his family part of the body and kingdom of Christ, a stone in the temple where he dwells by his Holy Spirit. God brings us together in Christ to be a city set on a hill, to be a temple for his praise. And this work of God's grace is made visible for all to see in the here and now when he brings us together in Christ in the fellowship of the local church and binds us together with love. What the city and temple represented are reflected in the congregation that meets in Jesus' name. The church proclaims the place of full salvation. Could you possibly count all who have said to you, let us go to the house of the Lord? I don't mean those who have suggested that you come to a church service or meeting. I mean those who have extended God's invitation to you to become part of his temple, his body his people, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard that call? Do you rejoice with those who said it? Have you come to follow Jesus? Oh, even today, even now, you hear that call again. Come to him. An old hymn says, let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is that you feel your need of him. Come and be part of his house today. The Lord's house is the place of full salvation. He makes his people a temple for his praise. Psalm 122 points to this. But it does more than tell us of the place of full salvation. Verses 3 to 5 show us the plan of full salvation. The plan of full salvation. Each verse tells us something about Jerusalem as the psalmist saw it. It's almost as though the song unrolls the city's blueprints and the psalmist takes us through them. He points out the main features of the plan, the things that make for full salvation. Each bit actually is something that the Lord has set in place. God is the one who brings full salvation. It's his plan. Look at each part here. Start with verse 3. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That speaks of unity. Wonder if you have ever had a whole squad of children to your house for a birthday party. They all happily play in the garden, but then you notice that one child is off on his own. He's upset with the others. Maybe he didn't get his way, or maybe they decided they could do without him. Some way or other, there's been a falling out, and now there's a bit of distance. Well, the same can happen with people who live side by side. It does not take much to make one pull away or feel pushed out. So how could Jerusalem be like a city where everyone is close to each other and all happily enfolded as one? 
God gives the unity. He gives something to hold us together that is more powerful than all that would drive us apart. That more powerful thing is a love for him. It's a love that responds to his love for us, the love that sent Jesus to die. It's a love that drives out sin. God draws us to himself and to one another. It's his plan of unity. It's part of his full salvation. Look next at verse 5. For there are the thrones of judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. That speaks of security. The king upon the throne was there to defend and to deliver his people from all his and their enemies. He was there to uphold justice and righteousness in his realm. The throne for judgment was set in place, the thrones of the house of David. And precisely according to the plan and promise of God, one from the house of David now occupies a throne far higher than any earthly monarch. There's full salvation because Jesus is Lord. He rules over us by his word and spirit. He holds us safe from every foe. When the Olympic Games took place in Tokyo in August 2021, a Belarusian sprinter called Kristina Tomanovskaya dared to criticise her national coaches. Before long, she was being driven to the airport for a flight home. At the airport, she approached the Japanese police. They took her into custody, and the next day, Poland gave her a visa to go there instead. She found a refuge. She found an authority that would say, she's under our protection now. That's what it is to come to have the Lord Jesus as your saviour and king. You find eternal security in him. You find salvation, full salvation under his wing. Unity, security. And then look at verse 4. It speaks of fidelity. The tribes went up to Jerusalem. They were the tribes of the Lord, the people called by his name. They were the people he had redeemed to be his very own. The Israel of the Old Testament expanded out to the church of the New Testament when Jesus died and rose again. We don't travel to the earthly Jerusalem, but we become God's people in Christ. That's part of the fidelity. There are two other parts to it in verse 4. One lies behind the words, according to the statute given to Israel. Really, that has to do with people going to hear what God had spoken. All that he declares to us, all that he decrees of us, Fidelity means listening to him, and it means giving praise to him. Do you see that in verse 4 as well? God's plan for full salvation is to have a people who faithfully rejoice in belonging to him, a people who receive his word, and who respond in praise. That, more or less, is what the church is all about. Rejoicing in salvation, receiving God's word, responding in praise. The problem, though, is that we are not always very faithful in it. We're called to bear his name. But sometimes your life is far from Christian, isn't it? We're called to believe his word. But you don't always live by it, do you? We're called to praise our God, but our hearts can be far from him. Our reality is far from fidelity. And our unity and security then are affected too. But listen, God has given us his son. He gave us Jesus. Jesus lived perfectly onto his father. He abided by God's testimony. His whole earthly life offered praise to the name of the Lord. And Jesus laid down his life to bear our sin. He rose from the dead so that we might live in him. He rose so that we might find our salvation in him. Would you wonder how you can lift praise to God or how you can live by his word or how you can bear his name? You look to Jesus. Look to the Saviour. Live in him. That's where you find this fidelity and security and unity. They all are in Christ. 
And that brings us to the last part of Psalm 122. The song celebrates God's full salvation. The place of full salvation is in the world to come. City and temple point us to the glory of eternity and the foretaste we have of it here and now. The plan of full salvation is in Christ. He brings all who trust in him to unity, security and fidelity. But then the last four verses of the psalm show the prayer of full salvation. The prayer of full salvation. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The whole song has been building to this conclusion. You see this? The psalm began with one looking back to what it was like to go with his brothers and friends to Jerusalem. And now at the end, the psalmist looks forward and resolves to pray. It's a prayer of full salvation. I've said a couple of times now that the city of Jerusalem and its temple both pointed forward to the world to come. I've said too that the Lord now gives us a foretaste of what he has prepared. We have that foretaste in the church. Joining the dots here leads us to see what Psalm 122 means for us today. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, you think of the modern city of Jerusalem and the ongoing tensions between Israelis and Palestinians and the efforts to share the gospel in the holy city. There is much to pray about there. But the psalm really is telling us to pray for God's church. And that comes down to praying specifically for our own particular church, our Presbyterian Church in Ireland, and indeed our own local congregation. Pray for its peace. Pray that it would have all it needs to thrive. Pray for the special work of the Spirit of God to sweep through in reviving power. Pray that its members would be marked by godliness and contentment. Pray for more and more of God's saving grace to be in evidence. Pray for full salvation. And notice, if you will, the three reasons the psalm gives us for such prayer. It is for the good of those who are part of the church. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you, verse 8. It is for the sake of those who still need to come to faith in the Saviour, that the house of God may be added to and built up and complete. And it is for the glory of God that his house may be a house of prayer for all nations, and that the shout of joy and the song of praise might never die away until he comes in power and brings in the fullness of salvation and glory. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who took a stand against Hitler and the Nazis and who, in the end, was executed by them in 1945. On one occasion, Bonhoeffer wrote this. A Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another, or it collapses. Psalm 122 celebrates the joy of God's people coming together in worship. It glimpses the full salvation God has promised and shows the place of it, the plan of it, and the prayer of it. This psalm brings you to your church and says, pray for God's blessing here. Well, may we see more and more of God's full salvation in our church in these days. Look for that. Work for it. Pray about it. And rejoice with those who say, let's go to his house together. And let us pray. We ask for your blessing, Lord. Spirit of purity and grace, our weakness pitying see, and make our hearts your dwelling place and all that they should be. Grant us to know the things that make for peace and to set our Saviour before us in all. Let nothing in us clog the channels of your peace, but may all we do be done in your fear. Mark us with the unity of your love, the security of your hope, 
and the fidelity of your Son in your church, Lord. Be glorified. Amen. Now this online ministry is produced by, primarily for, Donnacrony Presbyterian Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We do meet together in person each Sunday at 11.30am, so come along and join with us. There is a playlist of songs accompanying this message. Uh, you could use them now to lift your praise to God and to respond to what you've heard from his word. And may you, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, know God's grace and mercy and peace. And may you live in his love in the days ahead.